Back when I was 17, 19, I worked at a small local bakery. There were less than 15 employees spread across all the all night and day shifts. So we only had a few people working during the day. One of these people was Dave, the delivery driver. Dave immediately gave me an off vibe. He was in his mid fifties and way too friendly to a teenage girl. But the boss told me straight up that yes, he could be annoying, but no one worked harder than he did. So just ignore his antics. When I signed the paperwork, they never asked me to submit a background check. In hindsight, that should have been red flag number two. Over the course of the year or so that I worked with Dave, I tried very, very hard to ignore him. He was rarely outright creepy, but he was always just a bit too friendly. He would stick around long after his shift was over to talk to me and the other pastry chefs on shift. He always wanted to lick the bowl after I made Rice Krispie treats. He would always stand in front of the racks of equipment or ingredients, just enough that sometimes my hand would brush him while reaching for something. He always stood just a little too close. He was constantly asking about my life, what I liked, what I did for fun, if I had a boyfriend. Almost daily, he would tell me how a nice girl like me should have a boyfriend, how maybe a boyfriend would be good for me. I let this slide because sometimes older people can say things that were meant differently in their time. Then it was concert invites. Every other week he had tickets to one concert or another. Once he figured out my genre of music, it was almost exclusively tickets to bands I desperately wanted to see. But I also knew that I should not go anywhere with him. I don't like to associate with co-workers outside of work anyway, and I had seen way too many red flags about Dave to trust him for even a second. My birthday came. He brought me a t-shirt. It was two sizes too small. He told me to try it on. I said no. He told me to try it on after work and text him a photo. He gave me his number. He asked for mine. I said no. He asked the other pastry chef for my number. She had my back and refused as well. He also brought me two tickets to a band I've been waiting and wanting to see. VIP section, 21 plus only. He said he could get me in, but I had to go with him and him alone. I refused. He told me he could get me booze. I declined. For months and months this continued. I brought it up to one of my bosses, but they laughed it off as classic Dave. When he wanted a hug on his birthday and hugged me without my consent, there's Dave for ya, offering to get me booze or pot. Aw oh, Dave, you scamp. When he pulled up his shirt and showed me his abdominal scar from a snowboarding accident, well that's just Dave, no respect for boundaries but a good worker. I seriously considered having one of my big strong male friends come in under the guise of being my boyfriend just to placate Dave. I was repulsed by him, but he hadn't really done anything to classify himself as a predator. Besides asking for my number, he had never tried to harass me outside of work hours. And besides the odd hug or two that I was too afraid and shy to refuse, he hadn't gotten super physical. Then one day, Dave was gone. His name disappeared from the employee roster. My boss asked me to see me in the office. She informed me that Dave was no longer employed at their business. Dave had been fired. Dave was fired because Dave was a convicted sex offender. Dave here had two counts of rape and one count of kidnapping a minor from the mid-90s about the time I was born actually. They had never background checked him. And when they contacted a friend in the police department, they found out that Dave had been lying on lots of paperwork, hiding the fact that he was a convicted felon and not notifying anyone when he moved. Once they brought this information to the police department's attention, they had a few more charges to add. 
they found out because apparently he had been stalking and harassing one of the clients he delivered to, showing up at her home when he should have not known where she lived. After his termination, Dave showed up to work one day. He had a weapon, but I never found out what he had. They told him to leave or the police would be called. He ended up leaving in handcuffs. I am so thankful I wasn't there that day. That was a few years ago, but sometimes I still think about how badly things could have gotten had I gone to even one of those concerts with him. This is Teddy. My sister had a teddy bear, a scary teddy bear. I don't know why, but it creeped me out. It was just so disturbing to me. The thing had eyes that looked so real. It was as if it was made from a real bear and its face was just blank and unsettling. I first started to get weird feelings about the bear when my sister first got it. She was only a baby at the time, and I was about four. We had a dog, you see, and he had a habit of eating things, so my mother always had to put it up on the small cabinet in the corner of the hallway upstairs. Every time I went up those stairs, I saw that creepy bear suddenly glare around the corner at me, as if it was watching me. This wasn't the weird part. It started to get really weird about five years later, at the age of six or seven. My sister had lost interest in the bear, so my mother just threw it in the old toy cupboard. The only problem was, that the cupboard was in my room. When I was nine, old enough to stay on my own and go to bed without any assistance, I would get into my bed every night and turn my lamp off. This is when it got scary. As I was getting some sleep, I suddenly remembered mom putting the teddy bear in the cupboard. I slowly turned to look over across my room to see it through the glass. My heart suddenly stopped as I thought about the horrors the plush had caused me. But at the age of nine, I wanted to grow up and lose my fears. So I just shook it off and put my head on. When I got up to pull my sheets on a bit further, I noticed something that would scar me for life. There sat at the end of my bedroom, the teddy, my heart started beating normally again. I sat there staring at it for about a minute. When I needed to yawn, I closed my eyes. I opened them to see the teddy sitting closer to my bed. At this point, I was really freaked out. I started to move back to the wall and looked around to see if there was any sign that anyone had come in. When I looked back to see the teddy on the end of my bed, I was so startled that I almost fainted from fear. When I blinked, it had gone. I looked around. To my relief, I saw no sign of it. I set my head back down on my pillow, hoping for some sleep. Then, I opened my eyes. It was above my head, staring straight down. I screamed as it lunged down at me. I will never see a bear the same way again. A few years later, after years of horror, I burned it. I sat in enjoyment as the bear was turned to smoking ashes in my fireplace. I have lived my teenage life through adolescence. The only thing I could remember that was in any way similar to my bad experiences was when I watched Train Spotting. That fucking baby scene shocked me so badly. But other than that, 
all was well. When I turned 19, I was about to move into my new home. I had been given the keys to the house and was ready to set up my furniture. After hours of carrying, I carried the final box from the removal truck into the front door and shut the door behind me. I turned to go into the kitchen and put it on the table. I opened it to see a cabinet. I took it out, walked into my new living room and placed it in the corner. I stared at it and thought to myself, I don't remember packing this cabinet. I didn't really care that much as I had just moved into my new home. I walked back into the kitchen to grab my television and brought it into the living room when I saw it. The teddy, it just sat there staring. Hey everyone, Fear Crawler here. Welcome to the video. Boy, today must be my lucky day because I just want a free cruise. Though I'm not sure why they asked for my credit card information. Anyway, today's video deals with... Who are you? I'm a cop. Where's Mini Crawler? Am, uh, am I in some kind of trouble or... Uh... No. Enjoy the video. Everything happened so fast. Um, a lot of the details are fuzzy. One minute I was laying down in my cabin on the cruise ship, just trying to stave off the impending seasickness from all that rocking. The next thing I knew, there was a bright flash and a loud bang. I thought maybe we had taken a lightning strike somewhere. I felt the whole ship tilt at a very sharp angle. It threw me from my bed, in fact. I must have banged my head pretty hard when I landed. Everything went black for a little while. If it hadn't been for the sudden gush of seawater filling my lungs, I might have never gotten back onto my feet. By the time I got topside, the damage to the ship became clear. We were sinking fast. They were desperately trying to deploy the lifeboats in as orderly a fashion as one could expect from such a desperate situation. I headed for the one closest to me. There were only a few of us inside it by the time it touched the rocky waters below. We paddled out as far away from the sinking vessel as we could, just barely escaping the undertow. Those horrible screams from the seawater filled lungs as the other life bolts were pulled under was the most awful sound I've ever heard in my life. Watching those lifeless bodies bob up and down in the water in perfect rhythm with the swell was heartbreaking. We were the only ones left. I glanced over at my new companions, their clothes and skin soaked in sea brine. It was like being left alone with lost souls. They looked so dead inside. The thunderstorm raged on through the night. I didn't sleep. I stayed awake the whole night bailing rainwater from the raft and continuously pumping air into the bladder so we didn't end up sinking. I was exhausted and my seasickness had understandably worsened. The other passengers told me it was okay to stop and rest, that they would take over for a while so I could sleep. I laid down and shut my eyes, letting the darkness creep in and allowing my body to rest. In my dream, I saw the faces of my raft companions. They were screaming from beneath the ocean currents. Their skin bleached white and decaying as the sway of the sea peeled the flesh from their faces. A sudden splash of ocean brine hit my face and pulled me from my sleep. I could see the sunrise, but I was alone. The waves were calm now. I scanned in all directions for my companions, but it was all in vain. They must have fallen out of the raft and drowned. If I hadn't fallen asleep they might still be alive. I guess this is survivor's guilt. I don't know what to call it, really. In the distance, I could make out the shape of the keys. I paddled with everything I had in me to reach them. 
By the time my raft finally touched the sand of the beach, it was already getting dark. I pulled the survival bags from the raft and got to work setting up a makeshift shelter, as well as a fire to keep warm. This is where I've been since then. I have no idea how many days it's been. I'm not sure if I can even remember my own name anymore. I'm almost out of food. I just hope help arrives soon. What do you think? Sounded like a pretty good alibi, didn't it? I know you can't speak through the gag, so just nod your head. This wasn't supposed to happen like this. I told my partner to wake me before he blew the safe. I'll just assume he got greedy. Idiot blew himself to smithereens in the process along with most of the goods. I barely had time to pack any of it before the ship started sinking. I have to hand it to him, though. Sabotaging the other rafts was a nice touch. <sighs> Just glad we didn't all pile into one of the damaged ones. That, my friend, was pure luck. I'm sorry about forcing the others off the raft, but they were digging in my bags when I woke up. They might have seen what I had stolen. I can't have that. So it's just us now. Thank you for helping me paddle. Again, I'm sorry about the gag, but I hate the sound of screaming. It might be a while before I'm rescued, and I'm out of food. You wake up in the middle of the night. Your cat is cozily nestled behind your knees, and the weight of your blanket warms your tired body nicely. You sigh happily. When you are about to drift off again into a sweet slumber, your cat hisses, runs frantically off your bed, and hides behind the curtains. She has never acted so oddly before, and that upsets you. You look around in your room for anything that could have startled her, but nothing is out of the ordinary. You stay still, and listen for anything unusual. You can hear your cat drinking water from her bowl in the hall, making that disgusting slurping sound that always disturbs you. Relieved that nothing is wrong, you lie back down, and pull the blanket up to your chin. But before you close your eyes, you see the shadowy silhouette of your feline friend ducking under your desk, her hair standing up. You gasp. If it isn't your cat drinking the water, then... then what's making that sound? Slowly, and as silently as possible, you get off your bed. But despite your best efforts, the old wooden framework groans loudly. You freeze. The slurping sound stops for a second before it resumes. Any doubts that this was your imagination's doing are cast away heart pounding in your chest. You tiptoe your way towards the door. You step out of your room and look across the hallway towards your cat's bowl. And then, you see her. Your mother, crouching on her hands and knees. Her limbs are long and skinny and her fingers are gaunt and bony. Her messy hair covers her pale, distorted face. Her skin stretched against her cheekbones. She is greedily licking the water in your cat's bowl, with a tongue black as coal, and twice the normal size. Suddenly, she stops. She slowly turns her head towards you. She stares deep 
into your eyes. Her pupils, two unmoving dots of malice. You jump in panic and run back into your room while your mother gallops on all fours towards you. You close the door behind you, moments before it starts shaking violently, loud bangs echoing across the house. You quickly throw your body against the door, blocking it. The whole doorframe quakes fiercely, but you hold firm. Then, the banging stops. An otherworldly sense of stillness hangs in the air. After a few seconds of excruciating silence, the knob starts turning. Honey, is something wrong? You hear your mother's soothing voice from the other side. Why did you close the door? I am worried. Please, let me in. During my first year teaching, I had an incident with a student that almost cost me my life. I have freshmen in high school and I teach math. Now I also teach at inner city school, which as most of you know, may mean that I have kids that are a bit rowdy. I have one student in particular though that scared the living daylights out of me. Now this kid and I, who I won't name since he's a minor, have had fights in the past. He's called me several names from bitch to whore. He's attacked other students. He's a member of a gang. There was one time, though, that I feel like I may have went too far. I had just did a seating chart, and I put the student in particular in the back. Now, the student being kind of short, I asked him if he was okay in the back and if he could see. He told me it didn't matter, as he wouldn't be paying attention anyway, which incited laughter from other students. I personally didn't find it funny, and I told him the truth that I had put him back there because I knew he wasn't going to pay attention anyway. At the end of class, the student approached me. He told me that that was the last time I'd ever embarrass him in front of his friends and that he would cut me. Now I laughed this off. I have plenty of students that are part of gangs and it really wasn't much to me to have a student say it as none of them really ever followed through. But then the next day came I had some students working in the back on a standardized test on the computers. Now, as they were working in the back, I had other students in the front at their desk working on another assignment and had others taking notes. Pretty much the class was running pretty smooth. The problem with the keyboards in the back is that some of them are broken so they wobble against the table. As the rest of the students were working, I had one kid in the back call me over to his computer. I asked him what he needed, assuming maybe he just needed help with a question or he just didn't understand something with the test. But then he lifted up his keyboard, and underneath that keyboard was a knife. It was an old knife, but not a typical butter knife either. You could very easily hurt someone with it if you used it correctly. I immediately called the office, and as I called him, it occurred to me what the student said, that he would cut me. And again, I didn't take it too seriously yesterday, so I didn't write it up. But I definitely told the principal when he came down, and they spoke to the student out of class. Now, they couldn't prove that he put the knife there. In fact, they couldn't prove any kid did it, as this was later on in the day, and I had several classes come through. But they did end up suspending him for his threats against me. However, one good thing about students is that when you have a good relationship with them, they pretty much tell you anything. And other students did confirm to me that while it wasn't him that put the knife there, it was one of his friends. And he had been talking all day about what he said to me, that he would, in fact, cut me. And since then, I've quit working there, not because of this incident, that some children just aren't as innocent as we think they are.
The 24 hour game by Color Blindness. The rules are pretty straightforward, at least that's what I thought when I signed up for it back in March. In fact, when it does come to rules, the game only has two follow all the rules, complete all the challenges. To be honest, it sounded like it would be impossible to lose. Josh, my best friend, said that was exactly what the game wanted you to think. It's not about getting from point A to point B, Daniel. Well, no, I take that back. It really is about getting from point A to point B, but nobody ever does, he told me. It was Josh that first introduced me to the game last year, when he said that he got 12 people to sign up for it online so that they could split the prize money. I thought I had everything worked out, man. I didn't even know what I was getting into, Josh told me. So, what are the challenges like, you ask? That I couldn't tell you, because they change every single time the game is played. So do the rules, apparently, for that matter. And you don't get to know what those are until the game actually starts. It sounded pretty interesting back then, so I told Josh to sign me up too. Are you kidding? No, I'm not doing that. You've got a wife. You've got a kid. This game is not for you, he told me. It's just a silly internet challenge, Josh. Nothing more, I reminded him. I was getting frustrated with his attitude. Just because I had family, he now thought that meant he could throw in my face all the fun and crazy shit that he could do that I couldn't. So I went online and signed up myself. To be honest, after that I actually forgot about it. Real life got in the way, whether it was losing my job or being evicted. My wife Marcia and I really did have more important things to do than some silly online game. In fact, I even fell out of touch with Josh a while back after the move. I just didn't have the time anymore. A few weeks ago I actually found out that he died, or at least that's what the Facebook thread I followed said, because no one had seen or heard from him in about six weeks. That's why I was so surprised to get a package on my doorstep from him just about 19 minutes ago. In fact, I think it's safe to say that everything I ever knew about Josh, or about this game changed just 13 minutes ago. I actually almost tripped over the package coming into our two bedroom apartment after a long shift at my new job, otherwise I probably wouldn't have noticed it at all. There was a Roman numerical symbol on the side of the wrapping denoting the number one, and a more obscure symbol next to it that I didn't recognise. But I knew from the handwriting who had sent it, Josh, curious and still a bit wound up from work. I sat down on the sofa and opened it up. There were three items inside, an unmarked cell phone that I guessed had to be some sort of burner, a VHS tape with the same Roman numeral, and a firearm. The chamber was fully loaded. I think it was the gun that made me feel the most nervous, but it was also the item that compelled me to scour my storage unit for my VCR. It took about seven minutes to find the VCR, and another six to hook it up. The video came to life with a grainy image of my former best friend. He was staring straight at me, almost as though we were talking face to face. Hello Daniel, I wish you hadn't done this. I really do. But now here we are, and we can't go back can we? He said with a heavy sigh. Something about the way he was talking was making me feel very uncomfortable. You're a part of it now though. So I've been tasked with giving you your very first challenge. This one is easy, but believe me when I say that they don't get any easier from here on out, Josh remarked. Then the words that made my heart plummet appeared on screen. Don't call the police. You've got an hour, and then we can move on to challenge number two, he said as the video cut to black. I stood up and paced the living room trying to figure out exactly what that message meant. Then I moved to my bedroom to wake my wife and get some kind of idea about what to do, but she wasn't there. The covers were all neatly arranged like she had just gotten up in the middle of the night to go check on Michael. I raced to his room next, calling out to him as I pushed open the door. 
The scene there was enough to give me a heart attack. Clothes strewn about with signs of a struggle. Blood smeared across the wall. I knew it had to be Michael's. How could this have happened? I had just talked to Marcy only two hours ago. I ran back to the den and pulled out my phone. And then I paused and looked towards the static covered television screen. What would happen if I disobeyed the rules? Would my family be tortured? Or worse, it made me sick to even consider it. I put the phone down and sat down on the couch, trying to decide what to do. Each minute I've wasted since then, I've been trying to figure out the same thing. So I've decided to participate in this sick and twisted game, whether I like it or not but I'm going to be documenting each and everything they make me do. Maybe it won't help anyone, but if even one person hears about the 24 hour game, there's one more rule I think they should have included. Don't play. From an early age, I was told my dad had built me and I was built to help the family. Any feelings or thoughts that differed from his programming were to be reported to him as a malfunction that he could fix. It didn't take me long to associate malfunctions with pain, and I reported them less and less over the years. I slept in a basement in a box, with a thin layer of foam and a pillow. I didn't go to school. I didn't know school even existed. My education, if you can call it that, was a list of books on topics to upload. Most of his books were on topics useful to my parents, such as basic plumbing and electrical work, cooking, gardening and those written by my dad on my programming. My mom would then give me a list of questions to answer about these books, to ensure the upload was successful. Sometimes, the question would be tricks, or I would answer them incorrectly in the eyes of my outraged dad. My uploads were almost always successful, I had nothing but time and the intense fear of corrupting my processors if I didn't properly concentrate. Writing this now, so many years later, it does sound ridiculous, but as a child unexposed to the world, I only had my parents to guide me. Between uploads and maintenance, I had tasks to complete. This included mowing the lawn, tending the garden, cooking meals, cleaning and fixing things such as lawn mowers, washing machines, dryers and fridges. There was no downtime. I always had things to fix. I later found out my dad would sell this once I had fixed them. When I was 17 years old, my dad had to stop work and decided it was time for me to earn some money. The idea scared me, but I obeyed orders as I had been programmed to do. My dad would send me to the cash jobs mowing lawns and doing general yard work. He would usually wait in the car until I was done or leave and come back if no one was home. During these times he would put me on mute mode and said that he would know if I spoke of anyone. It was forbidden. If I malfunctioned there would be serious consequences. No one ever approached or spoke of me. Even if I had arrived home before my father returned, they would make their way inside without a word. I discovered later that he had told his clients I was deaf and mute and liked to be left alone to finish a job. It was simple. He would drop me off on a large property, I would do my job and we would leave. One day I was mowing a regular's house, no cars were in the driveway, so my dad left me to do the job. Shortly after a girl came out with a drink, she looked the same age as me, and for a moment I considered she may be an android too. It's pretty hot outside, I thought you might want this. She said handing me a black drink. It's Pepsi, I hope that's okay. She smiled. I had no idea what Pepsi was. It was black like the oil mom had made me drink, so I thought it should be okay. I still remember that first sip. It was the single greatest thing I'd tasted. It didn't leave my mind feeling scrambled like my mom's drink. I wanted to ask what Pepsi was, where she got this drink from. Did she make it? I haven't seen you around. What school did you go to? Pepsi girl asked. I put my head down and walked back to my mower. What was I supposed to do? You're not even going to say thank you? She said following me. I looked back at her. She made me nervous for reasons I was yet to know about. I have to work. 
I replied to her. Without another word, she huffed and walked away. I spent the rest of the day counting down the minutes until my dad would come pick me up. I was convinced they would know I had gone off mute, that I had spoken to someone. When my dad's dusty red wagon pulled up, I loaded my gear into the car and got in. No words were spoken. I felt a small sense of relief, but a small voice in the back of my head spoke to me. He may not know now, but wait till you get home. Nothing was out of the usual that night. I did my chores, worked on my uploads, and recharged my batteries. The rest of the week was business as usual. My dad was in one of his moods, but lasted from days to weeks. The longer the mood, the more aggressive he would get with me. The small voice in the back of my head spoke to me once more. Maybe he really doesn't know. Maybe he's lying. Once a seed had been planted, over the next few months its root took hold of me. For rare moments I was left alone, I did something I'd never done before. I watched TV, though usually on mute and in short intervals. I started seeing images of the outside world, happy families, cartoons and animals. It was mesmerizing and terrifying at the same time. The day that changed my life however was the day I turned on a TV and caught a glimpse of iRobot. Real androids that had sown real doubts within me. Though I knew something was inherently wrong about my situation, I didn't know what to do. Eventually I was sent back to Pepsi Girl's house and got to work. I was really hoping she would bring me some more, but I didn't get my hopes up. I was almost done mowing the lawn when she pulled into the property. I watched her drive up to the house and get out. A part of me screamed to talk to her. I thought of the scenarios carefully. One, I would find out the truth about myself. Two, she may tell my dad and my malfunction would need to be fixed. Or three, I might get Pepsi. I caught her at the door, almost out of breath from running, and she turned to look at me with a glare. Am I an android? Father says I'm an android, I blurted out. Android? She asked, raising her eyebrows. I told her everything that I've told you, and about a movie I'd seen of real androids. She stood quietly. I guess she was trying to make sense of it all. I heard footsteps behind me, and immediately lost all of my courage. My dad said nothing and grabbed my arm, pulling me away. I looked back at her, still with the same perplexed look she wore when I first approached her. I had blown it. That night was the worst night of my life. The fixing my dad did was worse than ever before. And now I knew. I am something. I'm someone. The seams were splitting. My dad no longer bothered with the usual half-assed facade that had become so apparent to me now. It was just straight punishment. Both my parents tried scaring me, telling me stories of police and the outside world. They were both furious but also shaken. I wasn't allowed out of the basement after that. The days passed slowly and my parents' screaming matches were the only form of simulation I had. I would put my ear to the door to try to hear what they were saying. One sentence drove fear into me that I didn't know I had. I'm going to shut it down for good. I was that it. I heard someone coming down the steps and fled from the door. My dad pushed it open but stayed outside. I stared at him from across the room, uncertain of what I was supposed to do. He threw a shovel into the room and clanged against the floor breaking the silence. Come, he said, motioning me out of the room. I obeyed his commands and was led into the backyard. We walked further out onto the property before he ordered me to dig a hole. What am I digging for? I asked him. What the hell is with all these questions? What happened to you? I didn't program you right? My dad had to be in his sixties, at least, but a shriveled up man still terrified me. Are you going to shut me down? Yeah, that's right. Gonna shut you down and get a new one. One can keep its mouth shut. A half smile appeared on dad's face, as if satisfied with himself. That smile pisses me off. That man pissed me off. As much as he scared me, 
I thought of what I was missing. Though I didn't even know what I was missing apart from the magical world I'd put together through the TV shows I'd seen. I thought of Pepsi Girl. I thought of the Pepsi and all the pain this man had caused me. I clenched the shovel and swung at him connecting with the side of his face. The sound rung out into the night, but no part of me was sticking around to enjoy it. My dad hit the ground and I started running. There was no plan. I hadn't intended for this to happen, and no clue where I was going or where I should be going. After cutting through a few properties, I finally stopped running. I collapsed into some tall grass and caught my breath. The stars were beautiful. It was the first time I'd be out at night on my own, and in spite of fear and uncertainty, it was the most beautiful night of my life. I decided I would go to Pepsi Girl's house. I knew it was close and had an idea of where it was. I continued walking and found myself at a driveway just as the sun was coming up. I knocked on the door until a worried man came out to greet me. I told him everything I told his daughter and he believed me. Thank God he believed me. The police arrived at the house to find my father with a gun in his mouth. He had already disposed of my mom. They told him to put it down, but he pulled the trigger and it was over. Over for them, but not for me. My life was just beginning. It was revealed to me that they weren't really my parents. They had stolen me, stolen my childhood, my mind. And at times I wonder if they just might still steal my sanity. Thank God for malfunctions. This encounter is second hand, but was told to me on multiple occasions by the person that experienced it. I'm a natural skeptic, so I can't say I 100% believe it, but his telling of it is pretty simple and didn't vary between retellings. I've known this guy for many years, and his advice and input on just about everything is well reasoned and always helpful, so I'll just take his word on it even if with a grain of salt. So, let's get down to business. My friend, we'll call him Marv, likes to go solitary camping on occasion to be one with nature and the things that go along with that. He is also an avid gun collector and enthusiast. I don't remember exactly when he said this took place, but it was a few years back and he decided to go camping on a whim. He packed his gear, a few guns, a hunting rifle and a 45 caliber sidearm specifically and headed out into the country on a vast property owned by a friend of his. He had full permission in the works. This happened close to Kissachee National Forest in South Central Louisiana. I won't be any more specific other than that. It's safe to say it's miles and miles of forest and wilderness. He liked to hike in pretty deep and camp at a specific spot he found a few trips prior. So he made his way in and set up camp in his usual small clearing for the night. It's now late afternoon when he heard leaves crunching and twigs being stepped on. He assumed it was an animal at first and got up from cooking something on the fire to try and get a look. He gazed in the direction of the noise and saw a man approaching through the trees several yards away. He has described his etiquette for dealing with other people in very remote places as always being cautious, as uh, most often, most people he comes across are armed as well. He tries to stay as friendly as possible, but still keeps his guard up, looking for any ulterior motives, as you never can tell what some folks are up to out in the middle of nowhere. He'll make chit chat with them, find out generally what they're up to if he can, and occasionally share a meal, etc. He's never really met anyone nefarious as of yet, other than his situation. So, one thing that sets all small alarm bells for him is that he knows he's the only one with permission to be on this property. And secondly, this guy's not dressed for the location at all, 
He said the guy was wearing a white t-shirt, short, blue jogging shorts, and white socks and sneakers. Mind you, Marv is miles out in the middle of the woods, and away from any paths, roadways, houses, or really anything. Nobody is going to casually stroll into his current location and dress like that, unless they are lost or confused. It was early fall, but not quite cool, very normal for Louisiana. So, there's a ton of mosquitoes, ticks, and other insects aplenty. You're definitely not going to have most of your skin exposed in the deep woods if you can help it. I know this all too well from personal experience. So, Marv assumes something might be up and calls out. Hey there, do you need help or something? Pretty loudly, definitely loud enough to be heard. The guy keeps walking forward, staring directly at him. Marv is starting to get unnerved, and as I said, I know this guy well, and he's cool as a cucumber in a tense situation. Getting more uneasy, as the guy is closing the distance, he gets to his feet and loudly declares, Hey man, can I help you with something or what? The guy is 15 to 20 feet away from Marv now, is standing at the edge of the clearing in the forest. The guy, looking Marv dead in the eyes, finally speaks and says clearly, Help me. Marv said that he was already starting to actually get worried at this point and because he said the way the guy said this was as if something that didn't know exactly how to talk was saying help me or at least that's what he first thought. It just didn't sound right. The guy, still not moving, says help me. Again, slightly more emphatic but really just louder. Mar said this is when he picked up on what was truly wrong about this. He said the inflection of the voice was more female and actually sounded like a recording being played back and the guy's lip and mouth movements weren't matching up with the phrase. It was like he was just opening his mouth, emitting the phrase and closing it again. Marv asked, what do you need help with? not daring to move. The guy, still standing motionless and still looking directly at him, repeated the phrase another three times. Marv, now totally unsure what the hell is going on, interrupts the guy. Alright, you need to fucking go now, unless you actually need my help. Do you need my help or not? He continued loud and firm. The guy didn't miss a beat and started up with the help me's again and took another step in Marv's direction. Marv told me that he did the only thing that made sense in the moment, and Drew was 45, pointing it at the guy and telling him, You need to fucking go. I don't care what you want. The guy starts to get more animated and agitated, starting to say the phrase louder now, over and over, but not stepping closer or backing away. Marv did what he thought was right given his current predicament, Assuming that he was dealing with an unstable or potentially dangerous individual and discharged around into the ground in front of the guy. This is where it gets fully batshit crazy. As the guy stops uttering the phrase, goes silent, and still staring at Marv, full on backflips like gymnasts do, back into the woods and immediately out of sight. Now, I know what you're thinking because... I had and still have the same reaction. That sounds like bullshit, but Marv gave no indication of falsehood and told me this multiple times, each time in dead serious demeanor. Marv said that the guy backflipped away effortlessly as it pulled back by an unseen tension coil. He described it as completely humanly unnatural and totally out of place. Marv said he stood there focused on the forest where the guy had just flipped into and saw and heard no further movement. It was like the guy had never even been there. He stayed like this as the sun began to set and the normal night noises crept in. As I mentioned before, Marv is a pretty unshakable fellow and actually stayed in the area for the night and next night 
before returning with no further incident. And when he had told me and some other friends about this, of course, we had asked many questions. We asked him to elaborate on the guy's speech sounds. He said the more he thought about it after the incident, the more sure he was that it was definitely a female's voice coming from the guy. It was like he or it had heard someone say this and mimicked it like a parrot or other talking bird would. Almost like a lore. He doesn't know what he wanted. He or it. It didn't give any indication to follow or say anything else. Marv has been back to the property since with no other strange occurrences. And the only other minute detail that I can think of is he did remember hearing during the early morning of the first night what sounded like a gunshot off in the distance and it did sound eerily similar to his 45. He thought that he may have heard it again on the hike back out. There are people that hunt in the area, of course, and it could have just been that, but he couldn't be sure. Since this incident, he did some online research of the whole Kissichi area and found many legends, stories, and supposed encounters dealing with skinwalkers and other unnerving bits of Native American folklore, not to mention mimics and other similar creatures. A lot of this encounter lines up with these tales, but there's nothing tangible to prove it, but even as a skeptic, it does make me wonder about strange things in the remote and untouched areas of our world that can't be explained. My middle school was walking distance from my house, two to three blocks at most. School ended at 3 p.m., or 3.15, and my mom didn't get home until 4, so it just made sense for me to walk home every day. One day, I was walking home after class as usual. This was 6th grade, so I was either 10 or 11 years old. I can't remember exactly at this point. In any case... It was a nice normal day for most of the walk. I was most of the way down my block, only four or five houses away from my own, when a green pickup truck pulled up in the street near me. The truck was facing the opposite direction I was, pointing away from the direction I was walking. A man rolled down his window and called for my attention in a friendly manner. Hey there. I was a little confused but I did say hi back to him. I stopped where I was, but I didn't get closer to the truck. He continued, Hey, I'm trying to find my dog. Have you seen him? N no, I replied. Oh darn. Well hey, I have a picture of him. Can I show it to you? Maybe you can keep an eye out for him for me. I wasn't the brightest kid, but man, I must have had some wit in me. I don't remember when, but I had definitely heard this story before that day. I knew this was a trick. No, that's okay. I'm sorry, I have to go. He responded one more time. Oh, are you sure? It really helped me out. Yeah, I'm sure it would, buddy. No, thank you. I walked home, not totally freaked out, but definitely knowing that something was weird. I walked inside, locked the doors, and called my mom to work. She was already on her way home from work, according to the people who picked up at the store. She was home, and I told her what happened. I'll be honest, I don't remember what happened from there. All I know is, from that day on... I would walk to the library after school instead, which was right next to my school, until my mom would pick me up. Looking back on it, I think at the time, I heard so much about kidnapping and murders on television. In school, assemblies, etc. 
that my reaction probably amounted to oh okay this is one of those things that always happens to people don't go talking to the man just go home that's what they told me to do that's probably why I don't remember too much of the details after what happened it was weird but it didn't terrorize me it wasn't until a few years ago that I put everything together that my entire innocence or even my life could have ended right then and there on that day fucking A plus to stranger danger awareness on this one in any case pick up truck man with the missing dog let's not meet uh, just a little correction my mom didn't get home until 4 p.m. I originally put that she worked until then which is incorrect sorry This odd memory of mine I've been thinking about a lot lately due to the recent Delphi murders, as the men I'm talking about look quite similar to the police sketches. However, my story took place 20 years ago. When I was 12, I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. If you're not familiar with this part of the state, it is not what you think of when you think of Arizona. It's a ponderosa pine forest with mountains. It also snows here in the winter. Anyways, across the street from my home was an entrance to the woods. As my parents worked and I was the first home after school, it was my responsibility to walk the dog. Usually, I would take him just inside the woods entrance so I wouldn't have to pick up his crap out of the rocks that people out west cover their yards with. Most of the time, I was too scared to go into the actual woods, even with my dog, because he was stronger than me and didn't listen to me very well when we were walking outside. There was another reason I didn't like the woods. Wolves, pack of wild dogs, sometimes cattle, in general, very dangerous animals. It also didn't help that I was convinced it was hunted, but this day, I guess I felt adventurous and took him on a walk into the woods. We went pretty deep that day and didn't see another soul because it was about 3 p.m. and people were at work. Neighborhood kids also didn't quite hang out in that place. It was completely dead. Now my dog was excited by anything that moved and was always looking forward to greet other people or animals. But this day on the way back, I remember him being steadfast, still pulling me along on the way back home, ignoring squirrels and trees blowing in the wind. Then, out of nowhere, a man appeared on the trail right in front of me. Now, when I say out of nowhere, that's exactly what I mean. The woods there are not dense, and usually you can see people from far away enough that they don't surprise you. The man was dressed head to toe in brown and tan colors and gave me a weak hey and did not make eye contact. As he passed by, I got this very uneasy feeling. I turned around to take a last glance at this man, but he was completely gone. I tried scanning the forest with my eyes, but to no avail, the man disappeared. I could see probably 50 feet of trail behind me, there is no reason I shouldn't be able to see him. My kid brain started telling stories to myself, maybe he's a ghost, no, maybe he's hiding. There is no way I wouldn't be able to see him immediately after passing each other. Maybe he was hiding in front of me because he came out of nowhere, maybe that's why he was wearing all brown, to blend in. The weird part, and what makes me think about this whole situation differently, is the fact that my dog didn't want to greet this man. In fact, he didn't bark or acknowledge him in any way. To this day, I have absolutely no idea what to make of this. <laughs> 